Ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear president, dear provost, uh, dear colleagues at Aalto, honored guests. This is a fantastic day for me since Aalto gave me a possibility to introduce you to our research field uh, in the retina. And I'm very thankful for this opportunity. So the title of my talk today is From Photons to Behavior, Resol Resolving Neural Circuit Function at Quantal Resolution. Over the next uh, 15 minutes, I will explain what this means. Over the last 100 years or so, uh, we have split the atom, we have been to the moon, and we have sequenced the human genome. So these are remarkable achievements in the field of science. And this is not a unique list. Um, a lot of neuroscientists or scientists would name the same, same thing. Some people would bring up other issues here. But the key question is, what is the next big thing? So I'm standing here on the podium to start to work for the next 20, 30 years in science. And your dream is to align your energy vector such a way that your talent is lined up with, with one of the next big things. I think I'm extremely lucky, since for me, understanding how the brain works must be among the big things which will happen uh, which will uh, be happening over the next 30, 30 years or so, if not the biggest, actually. In the brain, uh, the out outstanding performance happens in neur neural circuits, well-defined circuits uh, which compute information. And as we all know, uh, our humanity, our consciousness, what we are is based on what the brain does, what the brain is. And every one of us, to my knowledge, has one but none of us fundamentally understands how it works. So it must be a big problem. All right, uh, what is the challenge then? The challenge is that there is 86 billion neurons in a human brain. And uh, what those circuits are, what compute information, is by and large a hard challenge. We don't know which neurons, neurons contribute to a circuit. What are the inputs? What are the outputs? Uh, what are they doing? That's extremely difficult. They are extremely difficult problems. So uh, my approach is based on utilizing an accessible part of the brain called the retina, which all of us have at the back of the eye, and it's part of the brain. This uh, well-defined tissue gives us some enormous advantages in our uh, goal to understand how the brain works. The retina has um, well-defined signals, so uh, light is a natural stimulant we can use to stimulate this preparation, and we can measure signals, in some cases, across entire well-defined neural circuits in this preparation. And it's very uh, structurally organized structure. So there is, uh, this, this preparation is a, like a small brain laboratory. And uh, it's not a new uh, thing to study the retina. Ramon Cajal stained the main, main cell types already at the end of 19th century, meaning rods and cones, uh, horizontal cells, bipolar cells, amacrine cells, and ganglion cells. So the main five uh, neural types uh, were known for a long time. However, uh, recent studies uh, have shown that there are several subtypes of each of these uh, cells. There is about 100 different cell types already in the retina. And what we know about biology, biology generally doesn't generate too complex structures because they cost. So the fact that there are so many different cell types doing their thing in the retina also tells about remarkable complexity already at this input level of the circuit, uh, in, in input level of the visual system. So that gives us the other piece, which means that in order to use the retina as a brain preparation, you need that preparation to have the divine complexity to understand, to, to have the dynamics what you need to understand the brain. And I believe uh, this is one of the things what proves that that's the case. So uh, oftentimes uh, you might, may see this uh, picture in textbooks which compares eye to the camera and retina to the film of the camera. And I dare say uh, that if you remember one thing of this lecture, uh, 
remember that the retina is absolutely not a film of a camera. So if we can make any kind of a comparison, the retina is the most outstanding supercomputer that uh, we could imagine, with its computational dynamics, diversity, the things it can do. So uh, in this auto community, I would like to make a comparison, for example, uh, if we think about non-invasive brain imaging techniques, uh, and my colleagues here will know uh, better than I, but my understanding is that the smallest resolvable ensemble, a voxel, comprises something like a million neurons. The entire ensemble of retinal output neurons, ganglion cells, is about a million neurons. So in these kinds of imaging techniques, retina would be like a single pixel. And at the same time, this single pixel already contains all the information we ever experience about the visual world. So if you really truly want to understand how neural coding works and how the decoding, how does the brain read the codes, I think the retina is an incredible uh, possibility for that thing. At the same time, I don't want to de-emphasize the value of these uh, uh, global uh, brain imaging techniques. They have a value, uh, remarkable value for other reasons. So, um, to kind of market my research topic here, we also have to remember that the retina has a long-standing tradition in Finland. Ragnar Granit uh, studied the retina here in Helsinki already in 1920s, 1930s, uh, and studied ganglion cell signals like me and my group uh, do right now with different techniques. He used uh, microelectrodes, which were the state of the art of those days, and uh, make remarkable discoveries which, uh, together with his later work in Stockholm, led to a Nobel Prize in 1967, which he shared with George Walt and Keffel Hartline. So the retina uh, field is, uh, is a very, uh, it has a very big tradition in Finland, and we should never de-emphasize tradition, because tradition is always something what is sort of in the genes of the science of the country. So I'm... Uh, working on a very good feel in that sense. And um, so then a little bit, what does the retina do? So uh, when, uh, when you are, for example, outside watching a bird on the sky, uh, this dynamic image of the bird is falling uh, on your retina, and the optics of the eye forms a sharp image on the photoreceptor mosaic of your retina. And these light levels, the cone photoreceptors will uh, absorb photons. And already in the first synapse between cones and bipolar cells, the signals is, are spread into 14 or so different channels. Uh, parallel, that's called parallel processing. And finally, there is uh, inner retinal computations going on, driven by amacrine cells, etc. And finally, the signal spread to about 40 or so output channels, at least in mouse retina, um, and this signal goes to the brain via optic nerve. So this remarkable computation uh, allows us to extract the key features uh, of the visual environment before uh, putting all that information to optic nerve, which has limited information capability. In other words, uh, these signals, what the ganglion cells are sending to the brain, uh, uh, there each ganglion cell type forms an entire mosaic on the retina, and each of them, each cell is sending action potentials or spikes to the brain. In other words, the brain is watching uh, complete ensembles of, uh, of mosaics of ganglion cells, each, se each, each talking to the brain via these action potentials. And this way, the retina converts the visual world into action potentials, which, are the, which is the language of neurons. And if you could understand by looking these action potentials, what was the initial image, you could uh, understand how the brain reads these signals. So in other words, uh, this pigeon walking here uh, goes to the retinal mosaic of uh, photoreceptors, and, and the brain is watching essentially 20 to 40 parallel movies uh, at the same time, each movie consisting of these spike trains. Understanding these spike trains would allow us, in this context, understand how the brain works. No one can do this for naturalistic images currently, even in the retina. So the challenge is exactly this, that 40 different movies 
40 complete mosaics of ganglion cells, even in the retina, the challenge is too high. So we need to simplify the system. Uh, we need to find a niche where we have at least a shot currently. And for our research group, um, the innovation is go to these kind of light levels. If you go out on a moonless night and you are asked your question is to ask what is the dimmest star that you can see or what is the dimmest light that you can see. In this case, we can actually currently understand the entire neural circuitry carrying these pass signals through the retina. And we have a handle of the visual system, system with uh, outstanding uh, resolution. So one of the two main research directions and perhaps the most ambitious one in my lab currently is to try to track by electrophysiological techniques these quantal signals arising from single photons from retinal inputs to retinal outputs and then uh, correlate these signals to behavioral uh, performance of animal in a matched condition where we can actually predict uh, the uh, retinal signals uh, in a very matched condition to the electrophysiological recordings. In order to get there, we needed to develop tracking technology of head and body positions of mice in complete darkness, such a way that we can really uh, bridge retinal signals to, to behavior in well-matched paradigms. So, uh, why mice, you might ask, because, you know, we are primates. So, mouse has the advantage of uh, genetic, in we can genetically tailor these animals and we can, for example, in one of our primary studies uh, done by Lina Smeds and Daisuke Takeshita, Tuomas Turun and Jussi Tihonen, we used a transgenic mice line where we were able to separate the two main information streams. In this case, the two most sensitive information streams at the visual threshold and we can tell exactly what information the brain is reading. Uh, that will be uh, one of the key works of our lab and hopefully out uh, relatively soon. So this direction is one uh, direction where we are heading and th where this is all leading. So it's leading to a field what I call quantum behavior. If we can truly based on animal movements, how it scans the uh, visual space, understand the spike codes at the result of single spikes, what underlies the information, we can get to the point where we can start to understand the key dynamics of biological decision making. If we think about man-made systems, how does a man-made system differ from a biological system in its key decision making algorithms? That's kind of a di this direction. The other direction, especially developed recently here at Alto Lab, relies on studying small populations of well-defined neurons in the retina. Uh, my team has built a quattro patch clamp system. So this is an electrophysiological method where we can, uh, with four electrodes, at the same time approach retinal uh, preparation. And the key kind of a niche or novelty here is that by this technology we can study uh, small well-defined populations of, uh, of well-defined neurons, both at the level of their outputs and input currents. In other words, this allows us to understand, for example, how correlations in signal and noise shape visual signals. And uh, to my knowledge, this is the first quattro-patching uh, techno technology av available in the retinal studies uh, and, and very pioneering work in that sense. So, to summarize the impact, uh, our goal is to reveal key, oftentimes nonlinear mechanisms of neural computations across well-defined circuits and their impact on behavioral performance. And this leads to something what I call quantum behavior. We try to understand biological decision-making from spikes to behavior. And we can think about uh, the future direction, for example, uh, trying to understand how artificial intelligence versus biological uh, intelligence, what are the key differences? What makes biological system different from a uh, man-made system in, in its uh, performance? And the societal impact, uh, uh, the goal is to 
create new. This is not new in, in that sense that granite already started, but give a new wipe uh, to the rec uh, retinal studies in Finland and establish an uh, even stronger international stamp to this research field in, in the Finnish neuroscience community. I called it the renaissance of the retina field in Finland. And of course I do it with uh, long-standing operators of Finnish neuroscience, including Christian Donner uh, and etc. So, uh, and my, of course, my new, new people. So this, so, this relates to that. So actually, I believe highly in science, Sci science in it, when you try to break frontiers, those frontiers are often interdisciplinary. And to do that, you need the best people from the world to do that. And we are highly networking. So currently, one of our key uh, collaborators, for example, is Anton Chilinger, who has built single quantum guns so that we can actually excite the retina with one photon at a time and break the Poisson distribution. In other, in, on, on, uh, on other note, so there, are, there is an outstanding uh, collection of other key collaborators or neuroscientists in the world with whom we either directly collaborate or just give phone calls and discuss what would be the coolest experiment to do, etc. So the idea is to lower the barrier uh, for discoveries and especially being here in the north to be kind of a, uh, entangled to this field uh, such a way that we can know where the field is moving. And I want to create my Nordic troops to do that and we have kind of a big, I call my lab a tribe because we are really a tribe. The idea is the leading force is the science and and people have different in moment in this retina movement but we, this is a picture from uh, a bit more than a week ago from our retreat where most of the people joined. So to kind of end this talk, I started from the question, what is the, what is the next big thing? So if we could have a time machine and move, you know, 30 years to the future right now, the question would, would be what would, what would come to this map? And I have heard a story that uh, Olli Lounasma, who we all know, fantastic Finnish, physicist and neuroscientist told that when physicists start to study the brain, we can solve this problem in 50 years. It's a beautiful statement in its boldness, because I admire Olli. Uh, he came here back, created his orchestra, created the tradition, and trained some of the best current neuroscientists of Finland. At the same time, this boldness sometimes goes a bit too far uh, in that sense that uh, we all know that in 50 years from that moment the brain is not going to be solved. But today is the day when I'm installed and I can make statements regarding uh, what is my aim. So let's lower a little bit of the challenge and put the retina to this, this, uh, this map. Uh, we have a much easier shot by simplifying the system a little bit. At the same time, uh, I don't say that let's, I believe that physicists would solve the retina in 50 years. I, even that would be impossible. But I believe that physicists, biologists, neuroscientists, um, and top operators together can utilize this tissue of the, this brain preparation to really push the field forward. And my goal here in Finland is to put a dent in the universe and use this preparation to bring uh, to give some glory to the Finnish neuroscience community and change the world in that way. And I will leave you on that note. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.